All right, all right. I just want to tell each of you that you all look awesome today. So a round of applause for yourselves. You all look great today. In Psalms 147, it says, Praise the Lord, how good to sing praises to our God. You know, one thing that I'm thankful for on Sunday mornings when we come together is that we get to sing praises to our God. Now let's get to why we sing praises to our God. It says, How good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. The reason we come together on Sunday mornings and we sing these worship songs is for how awesome, for how great, for how good that our God is because He heals the brokenhearted. He'll go right into your situation and He will He will take over your situation and He will lead you and guide you. We serve a great, great God. Amen. So let's take these next few moments together and let's sing of the greatness of our God and let's worship together. Take it away, worship team.
from heaven's throne Acquainted with our sorrow To treat the dead we owe Your suffering for our
God, we are unable to accomplish the things that we need to accomplish in life. But in your presence, God, in the close proximity of your presence, God, we can accomplish what you want us to accomplish. God, in your presence today, God, we acknowledge that there is freedom and liberty. We acknowledge, God, that there is peace, Father. We acknowledge that in your presence, God, there is forgiveness there is no shame in your presence God because we are your people God we are the sheep of your pasture God you are the shepherd of our life God and we know there is comfort in your presence God and today Lord Lord we're just going to take a moment Father to remind you of who you are and it is because of who you are and because of your presence that identifies our life with you God and changes the circumstances around us so, Father, today we just want to declare that you today are wonderful, God. Oh, God, we want to declare today how powerful you are today, Father. We want to sing that today, God. Come on, sing that with us. How wonderful he is. We sing wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every Wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. Wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. Wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. come in this house today this is God's house it's not my house it's not your house it's his house you may have come in God's house today and you may have had the ugliest situation in your life you may be facing the most uh, dysfunctional problems in your life and every time you look at the problem you may get disgusted in your life thinking about that issue and that problem but I'm going to help you today to understand why our focus can't be on the problem but it has to be on the problem solver because the problem solver is wonderful. The problem solver is beautiful. The problem solver is matchless in every way and whatever problem you put up against him, he can handle the situation. So I want us one more time this morning, whatever you have been facing, whatever's been on your mind, I don't know what you brought in this house, but God knows. And I want you to sing this one more time, how wonderful he is. Because we are articulating who He is and not what the problem is around us. And when we do that, God rises up above our problem and He takes care of our circumstances and our situation because in our praise is where He abides. Can we sing that one more time this morning? Come on, wonderful. Just tell Him, focus on Him for a minute. How beautiful He is. How wonderful He is. Oh, wonderful, beautiful.
Father, I thank you this morning in this house, God, that every authority that's ever risen up against the lives of the people in this room has to bow before you. That in your presence, God, we bow, they bow, we all bow because of who you are, God, and because of how great you are, Father. Lord, we just honor you in this place this morning. We just take a moment, God, to just honor you and bless your name, Lord, for you are good. You are worthy of every ounce of praise that we have. You are worthy of every second that we have, God. You are worthy, Father. There is nothing that we have to do to prove your worth, God, because you've already proven that to us. So today, God, we stand in awe of your power. We stand in awe of your wonder, God. We stand in awe of your matchless abilities, Lord, to help us in every situation, God. We are your sheep, God, the sheep of the pasture, God, that you are the shepherd of. And today, Father, we honor you and we magnify you. And we thank you, Lord, for being present with us in this place today and being powerful to us. We thank you, Lord. Come on, can you give God praise to this morning? Come on, give Him a praise shout this morning. Come on, is that all He's worth to you? Give Him praise this morning. He's good. He's good. Shout aloud the praises of our God. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good in this place. Glory to His name. Yes. Yes. Our God is good. Our God is good. Is He good? Take it a little personal and say, My God is good. There's a difference when you generalize God and when you personalize God. We're going to talk about that today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the 23rd Psalm. Psalm chapter 23. While you're going there, I do have a few things that I want to say. Just in concern with some of the upcoming things that we have going on. There is a a calendar out front with a list of events that we have going on here in the throughout the fall. I want you to get that calendar. Make sure you get plugged in, get involved. We have a lot of stuff going on, a lot of opportunities for you to connect here at this church. And uh, we want you to do that. We want you to find a way to connect. One of the things that's, that's, that we value a lot around here that we've seen a lot of success with in people just finding their place in life and finding their, their hope in God and their real difference even in the family of God is our community groups. We're going to be bringing those up. Our fall semester is coming up pretty soon. And, but uh, I want to tell you, if you are interested in helping to host a community group, basically these are groups of people that get together and they have a, a particular study that they may go through. But the biggest point about it is they get to do life together and they get to lean on one another. And it helps us to connect people into real hope in more of a personal way, more of a community way. And they get to meet you on a level that's different. You know, we get to see a lot of great things here on Sunday morning. And I'm telling you what, what a beautiful atmosphere of love we have at this church. What an atmosphere of acceptance we have at this church. If you walk through that door and you don't feel the love of God in your life, you have a problem that only God can fix. I'm just going to tell you. Because we have a loving church. But sometimes just on Sunday isn't enough to establish what God wants to establish in our life. So we create community groups where people can get together. Our Wednesday night Bible studies where people can come together and grow together as a family of God. It's valuable and it's very, very important. And I want to encourage you to get connected, be connected, and stay connected. It's very, very important. In August we have coming up. Uh, our Family of Faith weekend. It's going to be a very unique weekend where we have a Friday night service where families come and bring their, their kids all the way through teenage years. And we just have a worship service, but it's a fun atmosphere. We have game time and we try to create an environment where maybe families who don't normally attend church would come to this church and see a side of us that is fun and vibrant and exciting and also a side of us that honors God through our worship. And then on Saturday this year, we're going to do something very unique. We're going to have an outreach day uh, in the fall. One of the things that the Lord has really put on my heart about this church in particular is that we need some avenues to be able to reach out into the community. We're doing good at loving one another, but there's some things that we need to do to, to reach out. We have an amazing food ministry that, that is helping people. 
But I think we can be boots on the ground. I, can, I think we can be feet out in the community doing things to serve the community and showing the love of God to others. And we're going to begin doing that, and I'll talk with you about that more. But uh, on August the 26th, we're going to have a, uh, a, an outreach day where families will have the opportunity to just go out and share love, the love of Jesus with other people in different ways. And, and it's going to be a very important day. So I want you to be involved in that. Uh, look for some upcoming uh, information about that. Turning your Bibles to Psalm 23, if you're there, I'm going to go ahead and read through this psalm and then we'll pray and we'll go back through some things that we've been talking about. David, the author of the psalm, says this. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You pray with me and over this word. Father, I ask you today, God, that you help me. You've given me an assignment today. I don't know every situation. I don't know every circumstance. I don't know into the heart of every man and woman in this room. But God, you do. And today you brought me with an assignment. to do today bring change and build us up in Jesus name amen 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 look at your neighbor and say God is my shepherd the last few weeks we've been in this series called playlist and we've looked at a few things and uh, we talked about how God is surrounds us with a shield it's one of my favorite things to think about God being a shield in our life we talked about how when our praises go up, that things happen and we ought to bless the Lord at all times. There shouldn't be a time in our life where we're not praising Him and we're not blessing Him. We talked about His love and how it is a love that is worth pursuing. And He is compassionate, slow to anger, rich in faithful love, according to Psalm 103. Last week, we talked about the power of proximity, that God is our refuge and strength and He is a very present help in trouble. And that when he is there, there is some benefit that we get from that. And I'm thankful for, for that benefit and that word. But today, I want to try and just to show you this passage in the 23rd Psalm that is a very familiar passage. I'm sure everybody in this room has heard this before. I'm sure that you have been to a funeral or somewhere where you have heard the words that David penned. That yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I know everybody in this room has heard that passage. But what I want to do today is I want us to understand the perspective that David had on this passage in this particular scripture that, that he brings to us in the 23rd Psalm. Because I believe understanding David's perspective about this will help us understand how we can apply it to our life. And today, I think that this passage defines a perspective in David's life that is a satisfying perspective. It is a satisfying perspective, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, in comparison to David, who wrote this 23rd Psalm, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, these guys, God inspired them. They wrote these passages. They wrote this stuff down, and it was... To, to hold out for centuries and centuries, and, and it would never fade out, it would never go out of style, that what they wrote from, from God's uh, divine moment in their life, that we would be reading it today, we would be studying it today. And so I often try to relate to Bible characters and, and the authors of the books to try to understand, you, you know, maybe from my perspective and their perspective, let's, let's do a little comparison. 
Now, I know I've read this scripture before, and I've talked about being through the valley of the shadow of death, and, and I've been there. I've been in those places that was difficult. I've been in those times when I've lost loved ones or, or just dark spaces in my life where I knew that God was with me. But when we look at David, I, I take into comparison my perspective, really, and his perspective, and, and that's what I want today to get to, to, to walk out of this place with David's perspective of God as a shepherd but David, when I look at David, I think about a couple of things when I compare myself to David. You see, I, I have faced a few giants in my life like David has. I can say, I can list out some things and say, you know, these were big giants in my life and I had to deal with those things. But I can honestly tell you, literally today, standing here, I've never faced a giant that had an army behind him. I've never faced a giant that had a spear in his hand and a sword in his hand. And I've never faced a giant that was so much taller than me I had to just turn and look up to him. But David literally physically faced a giant like that. And yet he was able to overcome that battle because of his perspective of who God was in his life. Now, just like David, I have had some challenging moments with authority in my life where, where I felt like I was shafted by authority and I felt like that, that maybe the authority over me was supposed to do something for me or try to help me in some way and, and, and they kind of turned a little bit and took a shift and it kind of shocked me a little bit and I thought, man, I don't, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm dealing with someone that's, that's in authority over me and, and I'm a little worried about how that's going to work out in my life. I've had those moments. But I can honestly say I've never dealt with an authority who decided one day to go out and chase me with his sword and his army with the intentions of cutting my head off and killing me. So in perspective, really, my problems may not be quite as big as David's problems, but my problems still matter. And I don't know about you, but I have faced a lion and a bear before, literally. But it wasn't quite like David did. I paid money to see them and there was a steel cage in front of me. And I got to throw food to him. But David faced a lion and a bear in the middle of the wilderness. In the pasture where he was taking care of his sheep. He faced that lion and that bear as a shepherd over those sheep. And it gave him perspective about how God is our shepherd. It gave him a great perspective about sheep and shepherding those sheep. And thus David can write the 23rd Psalm about how the Lord is our shepherd. But he didn't say our shepherd, did he? He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He took possession of who the Lord was. Now, I'll tell you, it, it's interesting to, to see the different uh, translations in the New King James Version. It, there's three different translations. Many of them do this. But in comparison, the first part of that scripture and that chapter stays the same and it doesn't change. And, and here's what I mean. When he says, the Lord is my shepherd, you can find that phrase in many of the translations of the Bible. Because they didn't change that phrase. The Lord is my shepherd. It was very profound enough that it is the same phrase in the New King James, the NIV, the New Living, and the Good News translation of the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. Now the next part of that phrase in the first, uh, first uh, verse of chapter 23 changes a little bit. And I think that helps us to see perspective. Our understanding sometimes is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But the, new, the NIV version says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. So David's perspective was, as long as the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And I like the New Living Translation as well because he says, I have all that I need. And he is affirming to us that as long as the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. And so the beginning of this song in our playlist is most definitely the foundation of the whole rest of the chapter. Because when David has the perspective of God as a shepherd and a comforter and the Lord of his life, which the word Lord here means master, it means a manager, it means someone who makes the decisions for him. When David has this in mind, he knows that he has everything he needs. And he knows that everything that happens after that, no matter how difficult it is, it's going to be quite all right because the Lord is still my shepherd no matter where I go. And so a little bit about what we talked about last week about his proximity. 
So it defines David's perspective of the entire chapter. He goes on to talk about things like he, God make, helps him to lie down in green pastures, leads him beside still waters. He knows that God will restore his soul. He, he knows that he'll lead him in the right path. And then he goes into the fourth verse that we are so commonly heard. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Rod and your staff, they comfort me. David knows because God is his Lord and his shepherd that all of these things will apply to his life. And he knows that even in the presence of his enemies, that his cup is going to run over. That his head is going to be anointed with the oil that gives him the purpose to do whatever God has brought him in that place to do. Such a powerful perspective David has on the scripture. We look at the word Lord that David used to indicate who God was to him the word Lord is found 694 times in the book of Psalms. If, if a word is found almost 700 times in one book of the Bible, I think it to be pretty important, don't you? Yeah. It's found many more times in the Bible, but just in the book of Psalms, it is found 694 times. He is Lord, which means He is Master. He is the owner of our life. And as the shepherd of our life, He is the owner of everything that we have in our possession, which means he controls our possession. When you think of a sheep being in the pasture and the shepherd is over the sheep, that's, uh, that's David's view of us and God, that we are the sheep of his pasture and he is our shepherd and he is also our Lord and he helps us to make decisions that help us in our life. The master is who Jesus is. The perspective that David has is not just of some generalized God who is out there doing good for all people. David said, no, he is my Lord. He is my master. He is the manager of the affairs of my life. And when he is managing the affairs of my life, the affairs of my life will all be in order no matter what season of life I go into. And that's how he's trying to define God. He is Lord. Jesus said this about himself in John chapter 13. When he said to the disciples, you call me teacher and Lord. And he said, rightly so. Because that is what I am. When they were trying to figure out who Jesus was and they called him master and Lord. He said, you can call me that. Because that's what I am to you. That's how, I, that's how this whole thing is supposed to process in our life. That he is the manager of our affairs in our life. And when we allow him to manage the affairs of our life, our life is so much better. It doesn't mean that it eliminates us from problems, though. It just means that we have a better perspective because he's in charge. And we don't have to worry. That's what David was saying. He said, he is my shepherd. The shepherd is one who cares for the fox, cares for his sheep. He, he, a shepherd's responsibility as, as defined by who God is, is, is the, the caretaker over the sheep. That does not mean that he, again, is just a, a generalized shepherd standing at a certain point and the sheep have to, to fend for themselves. No, a good shepherd is a shepherd who looks after his sheep, who watches out for his sheep, who watches for predators, who pays attention to see if his sheep are malnourished. And if they are, he leads them into better places. If they're struggling to, to drink in the water that is choppy, he leads them beside still waters. So there will be no fear in them drinking that water a shepherd cares for his sheep and God cares for us and that's why in John 10 he said Jesus said I am the good shepherd and so this idea of him being shepherd is that he is the caretaker and the comforter in our life Jesus went on to say the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep enough said about shepherds that a good shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep. That even in the moment there is danger. A good shepherd will lay down his life. Jesus defines the 99. That the good shepherd would what? Leave the 99 to go and gather the one to get them back into the fold. It shows the heart of a shepherd. Which is the heart of God who cares for all of us. Each of us individually. In every season of our life. Now, David knows this because David is a shepherd. And David experienced this type of, of, of 
attitude towards his sheep when he was the caretaker of his sheep and responsible for his sheep that belonged to the house of Jesse. He knew he had to take care of them. He knew he had to, to love on them. He knew he had to lead them to the right places. And so he did a great job at that. And when the lion and the bear came, David came out in his boldness and he killed the lion and he killed the bear. Why? So he could show off his pride? No. So he could protect the sheep because that was his job. And that's what God's job is for us. That's how he is depict here, depicted in, to helping us in those times of difficulty. Then David goes on to say, I lack nothing. What an attitude. I'm telling you, right there, that changed everybody's life right there. Everybody's life in this room that walks out of this room, if you can even walk out of here today and just look around you and say, you know what, I've really got everything I need. I don't, I don't need anything. I like nothing in my life. And, and so everything beyond this moment is just a great blessing from God. And, and it's God's goodness coming down to me. And I don't have to fight for it. I don't have to fend for it. If I got $5 in my pocket, it's enough. If I got $2 in my pocket, it's enough. I lack nothing. It changed your life. It changed your husband's life. And the wife goes into the store looking for new clothes, right? I lack Nothing. That was funny. You can laugh. It's okay. It's an, it's an attitude. It's a perspective. When, when you have the perspective that you don't lack things because of who God is in your life, then God will do a whole lot more for you in your life. Because then the things that you want will just simply be the blessings that He wants to give to you. And when your perspective is right, that's when things begin to flow right in your life. David was trying to get his perspective right when he wrote this psalm. But he understood it when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. There again, David took possession of who God was. Not generalized. You know, as, as a people of God, we have to understand that God is in this for us as an individual. As much as he is for us as a whole world. And sometimes we, we generalize God so much, I think that we miss out on the specific blessings that He wants to give to us in our life. Because we see God as this big, oftentimes people see God as this big general God who's this big overseer of the earth. But I'm going to tell you something. When you begin to see God as a personal shepherd in your household, over the affairs of your household, and not just He's not just a God who makes the, the earth rotate and the sun shine. He's not just that God who created billions of stars in the sky. He's not just that God. He's also my shepherd who lives in my house, who overlooks the affairs of my house, and he cares for me as an individual. That's how powerful God is as a shepherd. But David knew this again in his experience as a shepherd. David knew some things about shepherd and sheep. He knew that there were good shepherds and bad shepherds. He knew that when you look at the sheep, you can tell how good the shepherd is. Because if they're starving to death, the shepherd hadn't been paying attention to them. But David didn't want to be that kind of shepherd. And he didn't want to depict God as that kind of shepherd. He wanted to depict God as a shepherd who cares for the sheep. David, I think, in his attitude as a shepherd, probably affirmed a few things. Knowing he would often say, probably, that my sheep are safe. When Jesse said, how's the sheep? He'd probably say, my sheep are safe. When Jesse said, his father, how is the sheep doing today? David probably said, my sheep are healthy. I've been feeding them. I've been taking care of them. How is the sheep today? My sheep are satisfied. They're settled where they need to be. Satisfaction is important in the land of, of sheep. And David would say these things, I think. And I think that's what God wants to say about us as a good shepherd. A Sunday school teacher once Ask her children to, if they could recite and quote the 23rd Psalm. And a little four-year-old girl raised her hand. She said, I need you to quote the whole entire Psalm. And the teacher asked if she could really quote the whole Psalm. She was four years old. She raised her hand. She said, yes, ma'am, I can. And the little girl came up to the podium. She faced the class. She took a little bow. And she said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. And she walked back to her seat. She got it. She understood it. Everything else was important, but if you get that part, everything else will fall into place, no matter what's happening in your life, that the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. I just want Him as the Lord of my life and the caretaker of my life. It was a satisfying look that David gave towards God as a shepherd. I want to read you a couple of things about sheep. 
Look at your neighbor and say, I am a sheep. Bah. <laughs> when we think of the shepherd, we got to think of the sheep, right? I, I found some interesting stuff. There's a book uh, called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by a man named Philip Keller. Philip Keller was a man who was raised in uh, East Africa or born in East Africa, and he was a herdsman. He had, he had sheep. He had a land. And so he had a good, good uh, perspective of, of what sheep needed and how sheep reacted and how sheep responded. And I think that, that if we can look at his honest assessment of the literal sheep that, that he had in his life, it would kind of help us understand seeing God as a shepherd in our life, knowing what he is doing for us in order to help us. And this is some things that, that he said out of this book. He said this. He said, sheep do not just take care of themselves. As some might suppose, they require more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. He separated sheep from every other livestock that he'd ever dealt with. And he goes on to say some things about the shepherd knowing about the sheep. And he says that the shepherd knows how to settle his sheep down. It's not easy to get a sheep to lie down. The strange thing about a sheep is that they will refuse to lie down unless four requirements are met. Kind of sounds like me. Some things I refuse to do unless there are requirements met in my life. Number one, they must be free from all fear. Can't be any fear around them. If there's fear, they will not lay down. Number two, they must be, there must be no tension between the members of the flock and the sheep. If there's tension between two sheep or a few sheep, they won't lie down. Number three, they must not be aggravated with flies or parasites. Now, Philip Keller believes this is a part of that when he says, Thou anointest my head with oil. He said, literally, they would make anointment and put it on oil and put it on sheep's nose and mouth so the flies and the parasites wouldn't bother them because when things bothered them, they wouldn't lay down. And number four, they must be free from hunger. Four things that a sheep has to do in order to lie down on the ground from, this is the experience of a shepherd. Let me tell you something else that Philip Keller said about sheep. He said the shepherd knows how to calm frighten sheep. I thought this is very interesting. It is a shepherd who must see to it that the flock is, is free from any disturbances. Sheep are very easily frightened. Now a stray jackrabbit, now you've got to understand we're not talking about a jackrabbit that can attack and kill a, a, a sheep. But we're talking about a little rabbit that jumps out of the bushes. Now, have y'all ever seen a rabbit jump out of the bushes? If it startles you in a, in a moment and you're in the middle of the woods, it's a little bit startling. But once you realize, hey, it's just a rabbit, you, you don't get startled anymore. But this is what he says about a rabbit jumping out of the bushes. He said sheep are very easily frightened. When a rabbit jumps out of behind the bush, a stampede of the whole flock can happen. Because when one startled sheep starts to run in fright, all of the others will follow behind it in blind fear not even knowing that it was just a little rabbit. In their mind, they're thinking it's a lion or a tiger or a bear. All they're doing is following the rest of the what? The sheep and the crowd. It's very interesting, this man points out. And he said, but nothing quiets a flock of sheep like seeing their shepherd in the field with them. Because when they can look up and see their shepherd, they are comforted and there is at peace because they know that the shepherd is going to be able to comfort them in every season and every time of their life. That that shepherd will take his hook and pull it around them if they seem to be startled and frightened. And he will bring them in close to comfort them. And this is what David chose to show God as in our life. Because that's what he is. He's a God who cares. He's a God who loves. But how does that perspective help us? I think perspective is everything about this verse. Because here's something that I know, that when we have a clear perspective of God as our shepherd, it helps us have a better outlook on life. And I hope I can help you right here for the next few moments to, to look at some things and, and help your perspective be of God as the shepherd in your life who cares for you, who loves you, who's in every season of your life, regardless of what's going on in your life. He is a shepherd that can help lead you by still waters. Regardless if it's enemy in your life, he will prepare a table before you. He will help you as the shepherd in your life. But you have to view him that way. Because our perspective of God says a lot about our view of life. And when our perspective of God is correct, 
our view of life begins to come clearer and clearer and clearer. But when our perspective of God is incorrect, we are obscured in our view of life. Because if we can't understand who He is, we can't understand why or what we're going through oftentimes. But when we get this right, He helps us to walk through all of this. And I hope that helps you. And I want to try, to try to teach you that right here. Here's something that we need to know. First of all, our perspective reveals our interpretation of reality. Let me tell you what I mean. Our perspective reveals our interpretation of reality. It is a fact that reality happens. It is a fact that difficult times come. I'm not up here today to tell you that we serve a God who's just going to wash out all the bad times in your life and the difficult times in your life. No, that's not the case. That's not what He is as a shepherd. He helps lead us through those things. But the reality is that when our, our perspective is our interpretation, how we look at it. My mama used to say, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. That's about perspective. So when I look at a situation, my perspective, I can easily overreact to it and make a mountain out of a molehill. But my perspective in that interpretation of reality is just how I see it. That, that's how my eyes see it. I see a mountain, mama. I don't see a molehill. I see a big deal, mama. I don't see a little deal. But when we begin to see our perspective of God change, we can change our perspective of what we're looking at out in front of us. And a mountain can become a molehill when we understand that our God can help us through a mountain or over a mountain or He can even move a mountain out of the way if He chooses to do such. It's about who He is and not about what we're facing. Because here's another thing, that our interpretation of reality determines our reaction to reality. I'm going to say that again so that sinks in. Our perspective reveals our interpretation of reality. That means that, that what we see in our perspective is our interpretation. And when we have an interpretation of what's in front of us, we react to it immediately. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything in your life that you interpreted a little bit different than what it really was. But the initial onset of it might have gotten all over you and you might have thought, man, this, I've got to react to this thing. I've got to do this thing. And you, and you realize that really what you did was maybe even react to what all the other sheep were doing. And all the while it was just a little pet bunny foo-foo rather than a lion or a bear over there. Have you ever been there? Come on, let's be honest. Let's go ahead. If you're going to clap, let's praise God for who He is. But I want, you to, I, want us to, I want us to take in an understanding of this. Our perspective of life determines the interpretation of the reality that we're looking at. And when our perspective of God is right, our perspective of life should change to know that God can handle everything we deal with. He is our shepherd. He can lead us through any part of life, whether it be death, whether it be facing off with the enemy, whether it be anything in our life. He can help us through it. Because our interpretation determines our reaction. Now that's a big thing. Because oftentimes we can't take back reaction. Oftentimes we put reaction out to some things in our life. And because we put reaction out, then there are results of the reaction. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to or why I'm even going there. But God put this in my notes and dropped this in my spirit. And it's a part of my assignment today. That sometimes when you overreact to a situation because you don't understand God being your shepherd, you, there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen around that. There, there's a mess that happens when we react to our interpretation of reality. But it's real. And we're human. And it's natural. And God understands it because Jesus himself had to deal with it. Because Jesus himself had to face some pretty tough situations in life. But Jesus was able to handle it correctly. And I think we can handle it correctly when we have the right perspective of who God is in our life. And that's why David said, the Lord, the manager of my life, he is my shepherd. He's the one that helps me make decisions. 
I think oftentimes maybe David would not react to things, but he would respond to them after he had been with God and after he had spoken with God. Oh, how that would help us in our time of reaction, that rather than reacting to our interpretation of reality, we back off from the reaction and we say, God, how do you want us to handle this so we can respond to the situation rather than react to the situation? But it all started with our interpretation and our perspective of life. Anybody get that? I'll get that. Is that good? You'll get it. I hope. (laughs) So here's the thing. How we view God determines how we respond to life. That's plain and simple. How we view God determines how we respond to life. I can see it in funerals where people have a solid relationship with God. Where they understand who God is. And when I stand up and read that scripture, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when I read that scripture, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I can see that, that people who understand who God is, understand what that scripture is. But people who don't understand who God is, don't understand what that scripture is. Because they are reaching out to a God that they don't clearly understand as being the Lord, the manager, and the shepherd of their life. Which is why how we view God determines how we respond to life. David said, even in his time and the presence of his enemies, he said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. What did David understand about being in the presence of his enemies? Now, now I don't know if I'll have time to go there today. And if I don't, I may just pull, pull it over to next week. But there is a passage and a, and, a, and a story that the Lord has put on my heart about David in this situation. But what is it that, that how can David say that you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies? You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. How in the world can a man who'd been in such turmoil, who'd been in so many difficult situations, who had faced his enemy so many times say that right in the middle of my enemy's camp, my cup still runs over. I'm going to tell you how he can do it. It's perspective. Because he wasn't worried about who the enemy was. He was worried about who his God was. And he began to see his God as his Lord and his shepherd. And he began to say, I shall not want. In every season of my life, my cup runs over. I don't care how bad it gets in your life. If you will take the perspective that your cup is always running over. Some people have the perspective that their cup is always half full. If your cup is always half full, God ain't going to ever fill it up. But once it starts to fill up and you begin to say, hey, my cup is actually really overflowing because the things that God has given me is more than I could have ever had. That's when God begins to respond to your perspective in a new way. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Why did David say that? Because David understood the fact that God would anoint him for every season of life. That God would give him. He had seen it happen in in the bear and the lion. He had seen it happen in in Goliath when he stood before Goliath. He had seen it happen when he had to deal with Saul. God, David had seen every situation in his life that God would anoint him for that specific situation and help him through that situation. It it doesn't mean that the situations disappeared. You got to understand what I'm saying. I'm not telling you there's going to be peace in the valley all times of your life. There's going to be some times when you're going to be in the valley but when your view of God is correct your valley will have a different feel your valley will have a different outcome on the other side because you'll be able to see over the mountain instead of seeing the mountain that you're facing and that's what David was able to do and because of that here's another thing I think that's important and that is that fixing our focus on God will strengthen our faith I'm telling you fix your focus on God And strengthen your faith. Why? Because you can see what God has done all throughout history. Sometimes, again, when our perspective is that we react to whatever the little thing comes out at us. And we fix our focus on that little problem. And we get our focus off of God. We begin to think, how is God going to do this? Well, he said it right here. A thousand times over again. That he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all anything anyone could ask or even think or even imagine. That God is bigger than everything you've ever had to deal with. And when you fix your focus on God, your faith increases. That's why he said faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. And his word is our strength and our faith. 
That's why David was able to make such a confident statement. It's because he had a satisfying perspective of who God was. David said in Psalm 16, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of death, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of my life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David understood no matter what he had to deal with, God was able to fill him with joy. That yea, though he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, he did not have to fear evil because he knew that God would reach out his staff and comfort him. And every time David had to deal with situations that were heavy and difficult, God did just that to reach out and comfort him and to help him. But here's something that we have to establish in our perspective of God and we have to be careful about. And that is this, that focusing on our feelings will cause our faith to be fragile. If we focus on God, whatever we're going through, our perspective becomes that God can handle it. He's our shepherd. But when we focus on our feelings, we become fragile. Now, this is is a human nature to have feelings, to be upset. David knew those feelings in the 22nd chapter of Psalm. He he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a little bit different than the beginning of the 23rd Psalm, which said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. One chapter back, David said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew what it was like to have feelings. He knew what it was like to have distress. He knew what it was like to have discomfort. He knew what it was like to have sadness and joy. He had all those emotions that he understood. But he also understood that he could not focus on those feelings. That if he was driven by the feelings and not the faith he had in God, it would guide him down a road that would be detrimental to his life. Because I'm going to tell you something about focusing on our feelings. Which means that if it's all about how I feel. And when I feel this, I want to just stay in this moment. The Bible says there's a time to mourn. There's a time to rejoice. There's a time for laughter. There's a time, there's a time for everything. So there is no problem with mourning. There's no problem with being upset. There's no problem even with being probably agitated at times. The Bible says be angry and sin not, which means there are moments in our life when we're just going to have to deal with some stuff. We can't, we can't dodge it or get around it. We're living in humanity and it happens. But if we focus on the feeling, if we stay in the wrong season for too long, if, let me put it that way, then there are some things that happen to us. Because if we stay in the wrong season for too long and we don't get out of that season and see God as our shepherd and see him as our comfort and see him and be able to say that even in the presence of my enemies, God provides for me. If we can't get out of that season, season And that difficult feeling in our life, there's some things that happen. Our circumstances, our circumstances begin to shape our life because of how we feel about it. Here's three things that our circumstances will do if we're not careful. First of all, they will deplete us. Everybody in this room understands that. You've been through difficult times. You've been through difficult seasons. And you have felt depleted in your life. You felt drained because you had to go through it. And yet at the end of it, you think, I just want to break. I just want to breathe. You know what that's like to be depleted. David knew what it was like to be depleted. If we stay in that season, though, of, of, of feeling, the circumstance will also distract us. Because when we focus on the problem and the feeling of it, and we're not focused on God, and we're, oh, well, how I'm going to feel, I'm going to respond, I'm, I'm going to react. That's, that's really the word I'm looking at, is I'm going to react to this, and I'm going to react to that. And we focus on our reaction, we get distracted from what God wants in our life. You know it. You've been there, where, where you just think, man, this is all I've been thinking about. <laughs> it's just distracting me from what I need to be doing. And then after it depletes us and distracts us, if we're not careful, it will derail us and send us down a path that only God himself can go out and find us and pull us back in to where we need to be into his comfort. And that's why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. His focus was on God who was with him and not on how he felt in the valley of the shadow of death. 
He wasn't, he wasn't focused on how he felt. He was focused on his God, knowing that his God would take care of him and comfort him. David understood that. He said in Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. I'm so thankful for that, that he will never let the righteous be shaken. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Connor, you can come. Another thing that I think is a good perspective is this, that focusing on the promise will help us overcome any problem. Focusing on the promise will help us overcome any problem. David dealt with some big issues, which is why he talked about walking through the valley of the shadow of death, which is why he talked about being in the presence of his enemies. There's substance to that, and I may talk about that next week. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, you can read about that. David spent some time in the presence of his enemies. He spent some time in a place that where he def- when he defeated Goliath, that was the Philistines, right? The enemy of the Israelites. Well, you turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 30, and guess where David is living? He's living in the land of the Philistines, not the Israelites. Because he had to run from the Israelites. And he had to get over here to, to, to pl- a place where he was running from Saul. And he found himself in a situation where he looked all around him, and there was nothing but Philistines. There was nothing but the very enemy that he had already defeated one time. He was having to live among them. And while he was living among them, I believe that's when the Lord put on his heart to pen those words that even in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table for, before me. Oh, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. David understood that. That's why he understood that focusing on the promise will help us overcome any problem in our life. Circumstances can deplete you circumstances can distract you circumstances can derail you but when you focus on God as your shepherd and when you focus on God as the Lord of your life you can write those same verses that David wrote because I'm going to tell you something when your perspective of who God is changes let me tell you what circumstances can do in your life rather than deplete you Rather than than derail you off the rail that God has designed for you. Your circumstances can also develop you. They can also define your faith. And they can also drive you. Drive you in the right direction. To know that I know how to face this next time that I have to go through it. That's why James said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And then he goes on to say, let perseverance finish its work. What, God? I don't want to go through this. I don't want to deal with this. But he said, no, no, no. If you don't let it finish its work, it it won't be able to develop you for your life. (laughs) If you don't let it finish, well, the, the perseverance that you're having to go through, if you don't let God finish with it, then on the other side, you're not going to understand completely what He was trying to do with the whole situation. But oh, when you let Him finish, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. When you let Him finish, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The Lord is my shepherd. I have no need of nothing. Because whatever God is taking me through, He will sustain me through it. And on the other side, I'll be mature and I'll be complete. Stand to your feet with me this morning. Sometimes I have seen in life situations that did deplete people, distract people, and derail people. And it's such an unfortunate thing to see because you you sympathize with their pain. 
you often sympathize with whatever the issue was that the big circumstance that they were dealing with and your heart goes out even as a pastor you just want to fix it you just want to help them but I'm going to tell you something I can love I can lead I can preach the one thing I cannot do for people is make decisions for people that's what I tell people I, I, can, I can be a shepherd and I can be a pastor but I can't make your decisions only you can do that and nobody can do it for you and so your view of whatever you're dealing with whatever it is in your life you have to understand that if you will view God in the right perspective like David did you'll be able to see on the other side of whatever it is that, that you have to deal with and there'll never be anything that comes up in your life that you don't have the ability to say hey he's my Lord he's my shepherd he's got this I'm lacking in nothing not because of my ability but because of his ability he's got this it'll change everything about you it, when something comes at you if you're if you're quick to react to something and, and you just kind of you go into the to the crazy mode of, of of we got we got to do this or we got to do that or or maybe you just are, are one that just reacts with with words in whatever comes Listen, if your perspective of God is right, you will have the opportunity to take a breath and say, God, what is it that I need to say? What is it that I need to do? You are my Lord. You are my shepherd. And I know you'll help me through this situation. And He'll do it. He'll do it every time. Don't let your circumstances derail you. Let your circumstances develop you. But the only way to do that is to trust God as the Lord of your life the shepherd of your life father this morning God I have come with an assignment and I have fulfilled that assignment today and I know that someone in this room listening understands that maybe there is a view that they have of life